I'm going to welcome everyone to the uh, second economics uh, session. I'm Stephanie Waldoff from the Joint Global Change Research Institute. Um, just a few reminders. We have seven speakers today, and we have the goals to have uh, 10 minute talks with five minutes for Q&A because we do not have a separate discussion session at the end. Some of the sessions have. Um, please use the Q&A tab at the top to ask your questions. And two requests there, please address them to the specific speakers because otherwise it can make hard to figure out sometimes who, who's being asked a question. And also, um, I'm going to request that you do not use the thumbs up or like button on the questions because that changes the order of them. And then it's also very hard to see um, what's been asked and what hasn't been. So with that, we will go to our first speaker, Julian, who will be talking about the economic structural change under different greenhouse gas scenarios. OK, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very sorry for the, for the technical issues. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so I will uh, present here work um, carried out as part of the, the Navigate Ash 2020 project uh, that we did with colleagues uh, from uh, E3 Modeling uh, and University of Exeter, uh, and I'm from CIRED. And uh, with this presentation, I would like to um, to make two two points. The, the first is uh, an introduction about underlying the the importance of uh, structural change uh, in the economy in, in global uh, climate scenario analysis. And second, I will present some results about uh, the structural change uh, happening in uh, climate, uh, climate scenarios uh, with, uh, with multi-sector integrity assessment models. So first of all, uh, brief introduction. Uh, so what is structural change? So structural change basically is complementary and interrelated changes in various aspects of the economy, so such as sectoral composition of outputs and employment, industrial organization, uh, such as the size of uh, firms, uh, the type of supply chains, also technical change, and uh, demand and trade patterns. And uh, so why structural change is a key issue for, for climate uh, scenario analysis is first because it's a key driver uh, of energy consumption and GAG emissions beyond pure technological change on the one hand and uh, aggregated GDP growth on the other. And uh, some uh, analysis on historical data show that it's uh, actually a key, what was a key driver for the decrease of aggregate energy intensity of GDP, for instance. Second reason is that structural change actually shapes uh, part of abatement potentials and uh, barriers or opportunities for climate change mitigation. Um, because uh, abatement potential are very different across sectors, first of all. And second, according to development pathways, uh, structural change can lock in uh, high carbon pathways on the other end. There are some opportunities through, for instance, uh, change of consumption, consumption pattern to, uh, to, to go to uh, lower uh, emission pathways. And third point is that uh, structural change is associated with main socioeconomic impacts of climate policy, uh, whether it be sectoral cost or economic risk, uh, such as for fossil fuel sectors, also opportunities for um, low, carbon, uh, low carbon sectors. Um, it also reflects employment and job relocations and um, purchasing power, income distribution for households and, and related inequalities and, and poverty issues. So it's a key issue. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the structural change has been mostly treated uh, implicitly in, in uh, existing scenarios, um, such as, for instance, the reference preference scenario and, and the SSPs, for instance. Uh, with some risk of BAs uh, in energy and GAG projections. Um, so basically, um, structural change give a lens for systemic analysis of uh, key socioeconomic aspects of climate change scenarios and some related issues uh, about the transformation pathways, socioeconomic SDGs, and even political feasibility and, and just transition uh, analysis. 
And the way to, to improve uh, assessment of structural change in, in climate scenarios is to work with multi-sector uh, economic uh, integrity assessment models that are actually frameworks to, to explore structural change dynamics. And uh, to do so, they are based on uh, input-output um, accounting systems that makes it possible to uh, have a description of different aspects of the economy and their interdependence. For instance, with this model, we can describe the, the output of the different sectors and their value-added contribution uh, in GDP. Second, uh, it can describe the um, inter-industry relationships, but also um, uh, the households, uh, consumption pattern, and also trade patterns. And the main drives of, of change in these models uh, are sectoral productivity, first of all, uh, whether it be uh, factor specific productivity gains or total factor productivity, but also inter industry relationships uh, through input output coefficients, but also uh, importantly, uh, consumption patterns uh, with uh, depending on income distribution uh, and then savings and um, consumption preferences and, and through income elasticities, for instance. Uh, another important point is the trade patterns uh, and investment patterns. So uh, after that, I would like to, to present uh, some results of uh, a first multimodal study of, of uh, structural change in, in uh, emission scenarios. Uh, a study that aims at two objectives. Uh, the first one is to measure uh, and compare structural change uh, in the Basel scenario. And second, to assess the um, additional or incremental structural change uh, compared to the baseline that happened uh, in a standard mitigation scenario. So to do so, we use three multi-sector uh, IAMs um, that are capable of uh, modeling endogenous structural change. And we build two, two scenarios, so a baseline for design scenario based on the SSP2 uh, narrative with full harmonization of uh, key variables and parameters, except uh, the specific structural change drivers that were uh, model specific. And then we run a standard mitigation scenarios with a similar um, CO2 budget and standard in the sense that it's uh, like supply and market driven uh, it is based on supply and market driven policies such as uh, carbon price. So here you can see the, the harmonization that we get, got in terms of GDP at the global level and for the US and China and the, and, uh, the emission pathways. So now um, let me talk about the, the results that we had uh, in terms of uh, structural change in the, in the baseline. And to do so, we measure a structural change uh, with two key indicators, uh, the value added on the one and employment on the other shares of the macro sectors, uh, namely agriculture, manufacturing, and services. And so here, uh, as we can see on the graph, we have plotted the, the share uh, of value added, actually, of the three sectors against um, the GDP per capita. So in black, you have the historical uh, values uh, used from, from the, the World Bank data. And in color uh, are the shares projected by models. And it is for, three, for five regions, India, China, uh, Europe, US, and the world. So, uh, so as, as far as agriculture is concerned, our projections are uh, aligned and consistent with historical data. But I would like to, to focus now more on manufacturing and services where we have some discrepancies across, across models. What we can see here uh, is that um, if it is quite uh, convergent for Europe and the US in terms of here the decrease of the share of manufacturing and an increase of the of the share of services here, we can see that for some key uh, regions such as China or India, the the projection of structural change and the share of manufacturing and services are very different. And so this is a first um, indication that within the same SSP narrative, um, multi-sector model uh, can project can have very different vision of of structural change. 
So now let's turn to the structural change, the incremental structural change in mitigation scenario. Uh, and here you can see on the graph um, the uh, additional structural change compared to the baseline for manufacturing and services. So here we plot the variation uh, between mitigation pathways and the baseline in 2050 against uh, the structural change happening in the baseline between 2020 and 2050. And the straight lines here um, uh, stands for uh, the um, a one to five ratio between the two. It means that you can see most of the points here for, for the different region and the world um, are uh, linking to the result that um, incremental structural change is mostly uh, less than uh, five times the structural change that is happening in the baseline. Okay, except for, uh, for the US here, for instance, and for China for, for one model. So the, the, the key conclusion here is that uh, incremental structural change at the macroeconomic level triggered by climate policy is um, uh, of second order compared to the structural change that is happening in the, in the baseline. It's second order, it is second order at macroeconomic level, but if we take a look, a closer look to specific sectors, uh, such as uh, the energy sectors or transportation agriculture, we can see that the, the change uh, of value added for these sectors are much higher than uh, the macro level. Uh, for instance, um, the, the value added variation for fossil fuels sectors or electricity sectors uh, is much higher uh, than, than average. Um, and you can see here that the share of fossil fuels uh, decreased significantly for all models uh, in the, the mitigation scenario. In the transportation or agriculture sector, we also have some, some results, even if uh, what's happening for the value added of transportation in mitigation scenario really depends on the region and on the model without clear uh, qualitative results. Uh, for agriculture, we have a trend uh, with an increase of the value added share of agriculture, uh, mainly because of the development of biofuels uh, in the mitigation scenario. And so one uh, last slide here to, 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 to conclude quickly, to say that with this first study, um, we found that uh, we found a, an important uncertainty in the uncertainty range uh, for future structural change under the same SSP baseline scenario, first of all. Second, we found that uh, incremental macrostructural change in the standard mitigation scenario in the sense that it's a supply driven mitigation. Uh, is of second order compared to the baseline uh, in general. Third, uh, we however find that th there are significant structural change for specific sectors or industries. And fourth, uh, that these general results are also uh, dependent uh, on the region and we find uh, also strong regional disparities. And uh, as far as further research is concerned, um, so the first uh, issue uh, linked to structural change is to develop structural change scenario within the SSP framework, which uh, has been done or is currently done by, uh, by, by colleagues from PIC. But also uh, it would be useful to uh, expand multi-sector IAM analysis about, for instance, uh, more robust structural change baselines including, uh, of course, post-pandemic uh, trends to understand key drivers and application for energy and emissions. Also study macroeconomic impacts of climate policy and application for social economies and SDGs. Structural change dynamics for key sectors. Uh, it's where the, the action will happen, for, especially for fossil fuel industries. And finally, it will be important to study structural change in alternative uh, scenarios, such as very low energy demand uh, scenarios. Thanks a lot for your attention. And I would be happy to, to answer to, to questions. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, glad we got the technical difficulties worked out there. Um, we have a question in the chat, and I think we probably only have time for one, but people, please feel free to keep asking. Um, structural change can be measured in terms of value added, payments to capital and labor or in terms of gross output, value of shipping by the sector. Are your results different if you use different measures? Okay, so I think the, the question is about, 
uh, are we accounting for like a nominal or a real value added? Uh, I guess. So here it's actually the, the value added in real terms. So basically uh, it reflects the level of output of the sector minus intermediary consumptions. But basically uh, it is related to the level of output of the sector. And so, and so to the employment level, I've not shown employment figures, but actually uh, value added figures and uh, employment uh, per sector are, are, are correlated. Uh, and uh, the, the conclusion uh, goes in the, in the same direction for the two indicators. Great. And I'll just please remember, go ahead and um, address the questions to the speaker um, and we'll ha it will be open afterwards for everybody to look at. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for um, uh, the opportunity and to, uh, for everybody to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, work we did on uh, studying a new energy geography. And I want to see, how do I change slide? Hmm. How does it work to change slides? I have slides on the bottom of your, beneath your video and you click. For oh, I see. Yes. All right. Okay. This is uh, work that was funded by the UK's Natural and, um, <clears throat> Environment Research Council, and it's a project that uh, we called Financial Risk and the Impact of Climate Change, Frantic, uh, between the University of Exeter, Cambridge Econometrics, the Open University, Cambridge, and Perry in the US. So this builds upon <clears throat> uh, questions related uh, to uh, Financial risk in relation to climate change. So we, uh, as as some of you will know, um, <clears throat> there's a discussion ongoing with central banks and financial managers about financial risks in relation to climate change and climate policy. And there's a division between um, what's called uh, physical risks and uh, transition risks. So we were there to study transition risks. We engaged quite a bit with the financial community and we were told People, what they need to know in this area is, well, things like, are we already in a transition? <clears throat> what is the risk? And when may uh, fossil fuel demand peak, for example, uh, in order to figure out who owns the risk in the transition? So for that, we uh, use the E3ME FTT Genie uh, integrated assessment model, which is probably the one with the longest name. Uh, we uh, It's formed by a core macroeconometric uh, model based on historical data that's disaggregated between 61 regions and 43 sectors. And to this are connected a number of bottom-up models of technology, making about 88 technologies in total, uh, looking at diffusion uh, dynamics, S-shaped diffusion. And then we make assumptions about policy and um, draw emission scenarios connected to um, a our own climate model called Gini. And we also have connected to that a very detailed uh, energy market uh, model. Now, if we, um, given that we're in a transition now, as things are changing really rapidly, what we find is that uh, the baseline becomes ambiguous. Therefore, we've drawn a number of baselines in this project, the first being a more conventional one, uh, straight from the energy uh, International Energy Agency uh, World Energy Outlook from 2019 that has a bit like the RCP 8.5 uh, a warming of up to uh, 3.5 degrees. Uh, but what we see when we look at um, really detailed diffusion data for low carbon tech, we find that up to 2019, say things are changing really rapidly at the moment. Solar PV is diffusing electric vehicles are diffusing in many areas. And if we extend that, we find something different, 2.6 degrees of, of warming. Now, recently, uh, many countries have announced uh, targets of z net zero, that is the UK, France, the EU as a whole, Japan and Korea for 2050, and then recently China for 2060. And this is probably a game changer. And putting that in the model, we find a warming median of about two degrees, and then we created a mitigation scenario of net zero in 2050 that shows um, roughly uh, 1.5 as a median. 
So here are some projections of uh, technology. So <clears throat> for the four scenarios, and um, I show here power generation, travel, heating, and steel. And below are uh, uh, total uh, industrial emissions because we are, our model is comprehensive for all uses of fossil fuels. And now you can see the uh, INVE is the IE scenario, stands for investment uh, investor expectations. There's the IE thinks or expects there should be growing markets for fossil fuels all the way to um, 2050. But if we look at the rapid change in technology, it looks like this is not what's going to be happening. It looks like low carbon tech is already taking a very large chunk of um, the, the, the markets, say solar PV and electric vehicles and electric heat pumps to some extent. And in a new East Asia net zero scenario, this is accelerated obviously and in, in a net zero scenario where we have to have mostly renewables and electric applications. Now, this has very important um, implications for energy markets. So here I'm showing um, fossil fuel supply for the three fuels, uh, renewable supply. And we see that while the IE again expects growing markets for fossil fuels, we see peaking in the three fossil fuels. If we think that the current diffusion of technology is going to, to maintain itself. And of course, this is accelerated in the uh, more rapid transition scenarios. And I would like to draw attention to the fossil fuel supply when expressed for different countries, as well as fossil fuel demand. The two are different because we trade enormous amounts of energy uh, worldwide. Um, <clears throat> but of course, as we decarbonize, the trade of fossil fuels eventually declines completely. And because we don't trade electricity quite so much, quite as much, um, there's a large change in the trade balance that emerges for all countries. Now this translates ultimately to some financial risks. And here I'm showing um, cost distributions for oil and gas worldwide. Um, <clears throat> this is from the RISTAT data that documents 120,000 extraction sites. Um, and what we find is there's excessive fossil fuels around the planet, too much compared to what we expect could be consumed. Therefore, large quantities may end up never being consumed. But we also observe that the Middle East still has the cost advantage over every other region of the world. And so in a scenario where there's peak demand, we can imagine that some of the US, Russian and Canadian oil and gas might never see uh, the light of day and may remain in the ground. So we created two scenario uh, variants um, where we look at the behavior of OPEC in this. Now OPEC may imagine that with limited uh, markets for fossil fuels in the future, that they may decide they want the sales to be theirs. So one scenario is where OPEC maintains strict quotas uh, Current uh, maintains uh, constant shares of a declining market, while the other scenario is a fire sale scenario where they flood the market. And in the second case, there's a strong downwards pressure that arises uh, on prices. So we calculate prices by checking what the marginal cost of production is according to the RISTA data I showed earlier. Um, and now I show it for all the scenarios in these top graphs. Uh, so there's variation, of course, and now the QU is quotas and SO sellout. Um, it's the, f the flooding of the market. There's a downwards pressure in that case. But the more important change happens with uh, the allocation of these markets. So in the lower graphs, you see the percent change in output for oil and gas. And it's more heterogeneous in the sellout case to the right, and that's of course, because a lot of the production ends up in the Middle East and other countries such as Canada, US and Russia lose out substantially on sales of fossil fuels. Now on the macroeconomics, there are important implications. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in general, low carbon investment boosts economic activity by creating jobs and um, 
essentially investment. But uh, the, the decline in demand for fossil fuels implies the reverse for those countries that are heavily invested in producing fossil fuels. And the declines in investment related to the decline in demand for fossil fuels intensifies the GDP and job losses. But more than that, there's an important trade balance effect that happens through this. So the importers, by reducing their imports of expensive fuels, end up um, redressing their trade balance and spending the money domestically in instead of uh, sending it abroad. And that's Europe, China, Japan and India, while the exporters see the reverse where they lose these exports and cannot make up for that with domestic markets and therefore have important loss of economic activity. So if I look at uh, GDP um, <clears throat> trends, so here I'm showing a loss of government royalties, partly because that's that makes an important component of spending in uh, fossil producer countries. But if you look at the GDP trends, typically what we see is the big losers are uh, Canada, US, Russia, in large parts because of this loss in activity, while the winners are uh, China, India, Europe, possibly moderately, due to the, the relative balance between fossil fuel and uh, low carbon activity. Uh, and the same goes with employment. But you can see the Middle East can mitigate its um, uh, situation by um, uh, essentially uh, flooding the markets. So just to finish, uh, a summary of the uh, political economy of the green uh, energy transition or well, just the current trajectory is that importers are well off because they reduce um, their expensive fossil fuel imports while they invest in low carbon uh, tech, which creates jobs. They have not much to lose really, but for the high cost producers, um, they are worse off because other countries are decarbonizing and reducing the demand for fossil fuel, which affects them, but they could recover some activity by investing in the new tech, uh, the new uh, industries, while the low-cost producers, OPEC, expect to be the last man standing in the market, so they will keep producing and running down reserves as much as they can, potentially, and they may lose production, but by flooding markets, they could recapture some of the uh, activity lost. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Um, so, we do have a question. Um, Enjoyed the presentation a lot. You project that solar will take over also in the baseline. Do you take into account the challenges of solar beyond LCOE? Um, for instance, bottlenecks with respect to grid connections, infrastructure intermittency and seasonality, frequency stability. Yeah, so we have a, an electricity market model embedded in this. We look at intermittency and load bands and an allocation across load bands uh, according to how much renewables are present. And this is based on work from PIC. The, there's a paper by Uekert that looks at that. We integrated that methodology. So we think we are in good control. But of course, it's a bit of an unknown, uh, the degree to which uh, inter intermittency ends up being a barrier to the diffusion. So uh, de definitely, uh, these uncertainties are, are present. Okay. Um, we also have um, one more question and um, just two reminders to the audience, please address the questions to the speakers at the beginning so we know to whom they should be addressed. And please don't use the like button um, as it changes the order of the questions and makes it a little hard to follow. Um, so the next question is, do you also consider trade of new energy carriers um, CO2 neutral, such as hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, sin fuels, et cetera. Saudi Arabia has announced the target to become a solar superpower. How would that change the assessment? Right, so that's a good question. Actually, there's two things. I think the trade of new tech, the trade of solar panels, and the trade of, of the new, um, uh, say, uh, fuels. And no, the answer is no, we haven't done it. And it's 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 a question of data and it's not that simple to integrate in the model, but I think we are hoping to do this as a next step. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one, possibly two more, and there's a couple here. Um, thanks for a really interesting presentation. While OPEC nations may have the lowest cost of production, the need to balance their financial budgets suggests a much higher break-even price, I believe. Um, does E3ME account for these national budget constraints on the ability to flood the market? Um, 
well, we we do track what, what the fiscal balance is uh, in these countries um, and whether that goes negative. And uh, if uh, and we also track where the, the national oil companies go insolvent, and we have another piece of work done on this. And actually, it's quite interesting, but I don't have time to explain it. Um, just to say that um, <clears throat> there's two strategies you can flood and go with the quantity or try to uh, have maintained the price higher. And <clears throat> we believe that flooding uh, ultimately saves them uh, rather than uh, trying to keep a price higher. Okay. Um, one more and then you can answer the rest. Um, oh, actually we're, we're right at the time. And since we're running a little late from technical difficulties, I'm gonna let you just take the rest of those offline. Um, sure. Cause there's quite a few more if that's okay. Um, Thank thanks the audience. Uh, thank you Jean-Francois for a great presentation. So next up, we have Kai, who will be presenting on the cost of avoiding net negative emissions um, under a carbon budget. OK, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's great to be here. It's my first IAMC, and uh, great to see that so many people have actually joined this session. Um, my name is Kai, and uh, I'll be talking today about the cost of avoiding net negative emissions, and that's mostly under a carbon budget. And this is a topic that has already been discussed quite a few times today. Uh, or actually in these last three days, uh, but I'll go a bit, bit more into depth uh, of the consequences of that. Uh, so first for net negative emissions, uh, typically the IAM trajectories, uh, they reach uh, net zero at some point, then go negative to actually avoid, to, to compensate for the too high emissions that were made in the beginning of the century. Uh, if you want to uh, avoid that for whatever reason, then this amount of net negative emissions you will have to compensate for in the earlier on in the first half of the of the century. Uh, so there's two different paths that are possible here, one with net negative emissions and one without net negative emissions. And in this talk, uh, I'll show what the, the costs and the benefits are of uh, both trajectories. Now, first of all, why does this matter? Why is this an important topic to talk about? There are three aspects I want to consider here. The first one is uh, the mitigation cost, uh, because if you want to avoid net negative emissions, that means that earlier on in the century, you have to do more mitigation, so your cost will be higher in the first half of the century if you want to avoid this overshoot. The second aspect is that on the other hand, while the mitigation cost may be higher when avoiding an overshoot, um, you see that the temperature stays lower. So throughout the century, you see that the temperature stays lower, uh, but the, the damages will also stay lower, even though the end point in 2100 uh, reaches the same temperature, which is the same level of damages. In this case, that's the same, although I'll come back to that uh, in the end. And the third aspect that is important here are, is what I call the, the other considerations. And I call this the, the three T's. So you have the biodiversity, food security, and uncertainty. And these are very important aspects that also need to be considered, uh, but are a bit more difficult to quantify. So for the sake of this presentation, I will just uh, skip that uh, and just focus on the first two topics, which are the mitigation costs and the climate damages. All right, um, so first some, the model and then to some results. Uh, for the model, we use a simple version. Uh, it's, a, it's a model similar to DICE, um, but it, we improved it on a, on a few aspects. And uh, for example, we included um, uh, an open source optimization software. It's all written in Python and has some improvements over DICE in the climate model, in the uh, endogenous learning uh, assumptions and a few more things. But the important aspect of this model is that we look at GDP, and at every time step, we subtract the mitigation cost and we subtract the damages to get the full picture of how these two aspects balance each other out. In this model, we use a carbon budget. Uh, we fix it to 600 gigatons. Uh, we would also do a sensitivity analysis, but this 600 gigatons uh, brings us to one and a half degree. Uh, and we set an emission limit of either zero, so then we have no net negative emissions, or minus 20, which is really the low end of the, of the current uh, IPCC uh, scenario database. Now, for the results, first here are the, the emission path, uh, the optimal emission path reaching this carbon budget under these, diff these two different assumptions. Uh, uh, so you see the, the, the straight lines uh, where we allow net negative emissions and the dotted lines where we don't allow for this overshoot. Uh, so clearly, in the dotted lines, you have to do more mitigation early on. Uh, 
But what is interesting here is that we uh, included in the, in the different colors the different discount rates. And to be more precise, the pure rate of time preference. So how much do we value the future? If you have a high discount rate of 3%, uh, then you see that you have much more uh, that you actually can, you, have, you go much more uh, into the net negative emissions because uh, you, you basically wait a bit longer uh, before, uh, before going down in your emissions. Whereas if you have a low discount rate, that's the blue one, then you see that there are still some negative emissions there, but already much less uh, than in the case with the high discount rate. Now, these are the optimal pathways. So now the model has optimized the cost and the benefits of uh, each of the trajectories. Now, the question is, of course, uh, how optimal is it? And what's different in, in there? So uh, if we look a bit more carefully at the costs for each of these discount rates, let's first look at the middle one, which is the default case of the, the medium value of a discount rate. Uh, there you see that um, actually, uh, well, it is. It makes sense that the total costs of when you avoid net negative emissions are higher because simply you add a constraint. So the cost cannot be lower. They must always be higher because you add an extra constraint. Uh, now, in this case, you see that the total costs are 23% higher. And these are the net present values of the disc cumulative discounted uh, mitigation and damage cost over the century. But if you disaggregate that into the, the top part, which are the mitigation costs, and the bottom part of the damage cost, see that if you avoid negative emissions, you have 30% less damages, but you have 47% more mitigation costs. And when balancing this all out, it still gives you 23% higher uh, total cost if you avoid net negative emissions. This difference becomes larger if you have a higher discount rate, even though the differences are not that large uh, within discount rates. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on timing because uh, K1 already uh, discussed this uh, nicely in, uh, in, in his presentation, but this is more in a stylized setting. Uh, so if we look at the fraction of the baseline GDP, and this is um, a baseline GDP where without climate change, this just gives an idea of how costly um, each scenario is. Uh, basically, the, the lower you are, the more expensive you are because the further you are from your baseline GDP. Now. Uh, what you see in this, this nice time pattern is that the dotted line is, again, without net negative emissions. It, uh, the costs go up very high in the beginning of the century, but then at the end of the century, you do end up with a higher GDP than uh, with net negative emissions. Uh, uh, but, but indeed, the question was really, uh, you see that if since you have much higher costs in the beginning, uh, then it does not offset the, cost, the, the lower cost that you have at the end of the century. Now, if you look at this a little bit more carefully, you get an interesting picture. So if you look at 2030 only, um, in yellow, I included the uh, uh, damage cost and the mitigation costs are in dark blue. Uh, and you see that in the without net negative emissions, so avoiding overshoot, uh, you, you have 97% more higher cost in 2030 than if you, do, uh, if you allow for some net, net negative emissions. So these are very significant uh, uh, cost differences. Uh, even though if you see that the yellow parts, they are constant, they are the same because the damages, they will not change much in 2030 already. This changes a little bit in 2050, where you see that if you have net negative emissions, your emissions are higher, so you have a little bit more damages, uh, but you have uh, le much less mitigation costs. So in total, you still have 75% more cost when avoiding net negative emissions. Uh, in gray, I added here the, the, the growth effects, because if you are um, in a lower GDP level at, uh, at point T, then at the next time step, you'll also be lower because of you have less growth uh, for that. And that's the, the extra part in gray that you see here. Now, if we go to 2070, these balance out. Uh, the GDPs are, are pretty much the same. Uh, still, that the damages are higher, but the mitigation costs start to increase for the net negative emissions. And in 2100, the, the mitigation costs are much higher. Uh, simply because you, you, are, you go very much into the negative emissions, and so you have to do much more there. And your damages, are, again, are at the same level uh, because we reached the same target. OK, and another very important aspect that we want to consider here, and I think this is a, a slightly a new aspect to this work, is that we look at uh, how are, what happens if the damages are not reversible. Um, 
So there are some, some climate damages that, are, that could be very well reversible, like impacts on yields. If the temperature goes down, then the, the yields will, will go to, a, the, to the same level as they were before. Uh, Vector-borne diseases, if a mosquito goes into a new territory where it had become warmer, but if it becomes cooler, then it will go back. Uh, impacts on uh, more uh, air conditioning, electricity use, for example. But on the other hand, there are damages like uh, melting uh, glaciers or melting ice, uh, that cause a sea level rise that might be partially irreversible. Uh, same for species extinction. If a polar bear is extinct, then it will not come back if temperature goes down again, uh, or biodiversity loss. Uh, so in total, we don't know exactly how much percentage of all these damages is actually reversible. Um, and just to be clear, if, if everything is not reversible, then it does not make sense to go negative because then you don't have any benefits of it. So to model this, uh, we looked at, um, uh, so on the left, you have the temperature relation, and on the right, you have the corresponding damage relation. Uh, in the normal case, if everything is reversible, then this is a one-to-one -one, um, relationship. However, if we include that, say, that 50% of the damages are reversible, uh, then if the temperature goes down, then the damages only go down much slightlier. So it will go at a higher level uh, of damages at the end of the century. And same for if you have 0% of reversible, then it will just never go down again. Now, since it, in this case, if it's 0%, you can never go down, then it does not make sense to, do, uh, to reach a carbon budget. Uh, so we have to look at cost-benefit analysis. We did look how to implement this for, cost, uh, for a carbon budget setting, but that's, uh, we'll skip that for the sake of time. So if we do a cost-benefit analysis, where on the x-axis here, we have the percentage reversible damages, so the same colors that I showed in the previous graph, um, this is my last slide, actually. Um, then you see that already at 50% reversible, you have almost no negative emissions anymore that are optimal in this case. Uh, and in this case, we only looked at the low mitigation cost or high damages, because otherwise in the cost-benefit mode, you wouldn't even have any negative emissions. But the same results are pretty much true for, uh, for a carbon budget setting. All right, so uh, to conclude, are we positive about negative emissions? Well, first of all, we are positive that some form of overshoot is probably attractive. Um, on the medium assumptions, uh, about 15 to 25% cheaper. However, if you assume that uh, damages are partially or fully irreversible, then it becomes less attractive. And there's these very important other considerations that we uh, discussed in the very first part of this talk. Uh, that still have to be considered. And this was purely from the economic perspective uh, that, uh, that we did that talk. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, happy to uh, answer questions. Thanks very much, Kai. Um, that was very interesting. Um, if folks want to start putting questions in the Q&A tab, that would be great. And in the meantime, um, I was wondering how um, you estimate your damage costs. Like, what is the, the function from which you're estimating those? Yes, thank you, Stephanie, for this question. Um, so we assumed as a medium damage function, uh, the Howard and Sterner um, me, me best estimate of the damage function. However, our results are really very much dependent on the huge uncertainty that currently exists on damage functions. So we've got uh, on the low end, the DICE, current DICE damage function, then uh, there's almost no benefit of, of, uh, of avoiding your net negative emissions. But if you go all the way up to the, to the, the high level Berg uh, empirical uh, damages, then, then this difference becomes just much, much higher. Uh, so for the damages, we use the Howard and Sterner, uh, the, the total uh, uh, damage function there. Well, you just answered my second question too, which was how sensitive the results were to different uh, 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 ways of estimating different values. Okay. Yeah, maybe one last thing. It, it is uh, also dependent on, or quite sensitive on the, the level of mitigation costs, uh, but that's a bit less than of the, of the damage cost. Uh, that is really the driving uh, uncertainty there. Oh, excellent. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, great talk. You're looking at net negative global emissions. However, what is the role of negative emissions in the overall mitigation process? Um, yeah, so thanks for the question. I, um, I'm not exactly sure I, uh, I understand the, the question. So uh, indeed, we look at global um, damages, but uh, so the, the role of, of uh, negative emissions, they are in our case, just similar to net negative emissions, but we just include them as an option in the mitigation cost curve. 
so that at some point, if you want to go lower, you can choose for either negative emissions or other technologies. But if you want to go net negative, you really have to do a lot of negative emissions. Uh, but I, I have the feeling that I didn't and didn't uh, uh, re reply to the question well. But uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, maybe some clarification would be nice. Yeah, and you can always clarify in the um, in the um, chat. Yeah, of course. Uh, and and it looks we we just got a whole came in. <laughs> okay, I have some work then. <laughs> yeah, so maybe um, yeah, if you want to just I don't even know which one to read first. There's so many. Um, <laughs> So if you want to work through those, maybe uh, yes. uh, online in the replies. So next up is Christoph, who will be presenting on energy system developments and investments um, in the Paris Agreement targets. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present uh, this uh, group effort. It's part of the Engage project that you have uh, heard about in some other presentations already. Um, and the aim of the study is to understand in a detailed way the energy investment requirements in the next coming 10 years for limiting peak warming to a specific level. So it's basically a bit um, kind of motivated by Kai's presentation. You can say in terms of a precautionary principle, the first decision that we need to take is kind of where do we kind of end uh, the, the warming trajectory at what peak level? And then the question of whether or not we have a temperature reduction afterwards via ne negative emissions, um, we can yeah, let uh, the next generation decide because basically um, we don't need to take that decision as of now. Um, a very important risk uh, question is where will be that peak warming, um, also due to some of the effects Kyle had mentioned. So, and in order to limit peak warming, it really is crucial what happens in the next 10 years. I'll show you that in a second. And um, this also helps kind of in terms of the overall literature that so far has rather kind of with a coarser um, um, focus only looked at the uh, energy investment implications of climate mitigation. So what we have done to kind of be able to be more granular in our analysis, both in terms of sectors and in terms of uh, the temporal granularities, to first make sure that the calibration of the six global models that we use for 2020 of the power system configuration and the energy system configuration at whole, but also the capital cost assumption is really up to date. And then we use um, two set of scenarios um, with a peak cumulative CO2 budget formulation um, really ranging from 400 gigaton to 300 gigaton um, with either immediate action after 2020 or we also look at scenarios where we have a delay of 10 years. So until 2030s, all the models only anticipate the NDC targets and only thereafter you still try to limit um, the peak warming to lowest level possible. Um, again, like through these different uh, scenario settings that you uh, try to reach between 400 and 3000 gigatons. And we compared these scenarios to two reference scenarios. One, an NDC was reaching 2030 targets and then only an extrapolation of a similar ambition level and an NPI national policies um, scenario where only the current status of legislation is extrapolated um, to the future. So in terms of the first result, we see here um, on the x-axis the peak budget um, that, that was kind of um, yeah, forced for these different scenarios. You see basically for each model a line representing this ensemble of scenarios here showing the immediate scenario. So if action is um, kind of ramped up for climate mitigation as of tomorrow, so to say. And then you see this really nice uh, relationship between the peak budget um, CO2 emissions and the median warming on the y-axis. And what you also see is that um, uh, kind of um, in order to reach um, these especially low budget targets, you really require escalating carbon prices. On the right hand side, this is the carbon prices um, required 10 years after introduction of the ambitious policy. So in this case, here showing it for 2030. There is some variation across models, but especially the overall qualitative uh, structure of that curve with the highly increasing carbon prices for very ambitious uh, climate targets is the same across models. And now, if we introduce as well delay scenarios to that graph, on the left-hand side, there is not much that changes. You see, um, basically, this relationship still, ship still holds, but on the right-hand side, um, here now showing the, the carbon prices again, 10 years after introduction of this uh, ambitious climate target, you really um, 
with the same level of ambition only achieve uh, roughly 400 gigaton higher cumulative CO2 budget, which roughly translate with the relationship that you see on the left hand side to 0.2 uh, degrees of peak warming that basically you yeah, um, guarantee to uh, achieve or like like yeah to, you have to live with if you limit action for the next 10 years to only the currently um, agreed NDC target. Um, on that graph on the left, um, here just to motivate, I'll have a few of these uh, figures more with kind of this uh, peak budget at the x-axis, and I color um, these areas up to 600 gigatons and up to 1,000 gigatons um, to yeah um, kind of categorize the scenarios that can be interpreted as well below two degree or into a category of 1.5 degrees uh, scenarios with just limited overshoot. Again, I'm um, saying here, this is median warming uh, shown here on the y-axis level. So if, and then this is exactly one of these figures. So you see here what needs to happen um, in the next 10 years in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, they are indexed to the 2020 value in the models actually without really having COVID. Um, in the modeling. So it's basically, you can also say in real world, um, this is kind of the relative uh, number compared to 2019, pretty much. And um, next to the different peak budgets, we also show here um, on the right side of, of uh, this, the NDC and NPI scenario. So with current policies, there would likely be a small increase of emissions up to 2030 still, but with current targets, there is actually already basically a stabilization to be expected for the next 10 years. But if you now want to reach very ambitious um, peak temperature targets, um, as indicated with the green areas, CO2 emissions in the next 10 years really have to um, be reduced to levels um, of yeah up to 50% or even more in some models. And to now look into how these changes come about, um, that's basically um, two of the three components of a typical Kaya decomposition. The GDP, the increasing GDP is not shown here, which would be very similar across all scenarios and models. But on the right-hand side, um, on the top, you see the energy intensity of GDP, where you see that energy intensity goes down in all scenarios. But there is also an additional um, effect of climate policy with a further reduction of this energy intensity. But then very uh, strikingly, splitting out the emission intensity into two components on the right hand side all non-electric fuels so gases solids liquids heat and hydrogen you only have a very small effect of improving energy intensity out to 2030 whereas on the left hand side you see for electricity the energy in, uh, emission intensity of of that uh, fuel improves uh, considerably already with NDC targets and also a bit with, with current um, policy, but it also offers ways of reducing the emission intensity um, much more drastically, um, really reaching levels um, close to 25% of current emission intensity globally. Um, and so this shows that really in the next decade, one of the key um, determinants for whether or not kind of we are on track to reaching uh, ambitious peak temperature target is whether or not we manage to bring about this uh, strong decarbonization of electricity, which is also very important because only if electricity is decarbonized, then it makes sense to use electrification um, to, to decarbonize also other sectors. So what are the investment required to bring about uh, these changes um, in the energy system? Um, on, on the following graphs, um, next to the modeling results um, in the format that you are already used to, I also show um, reference data from the IEA. So with that dashed horizontal line, the 2019 level of investments in the um, as, uh, yeah, respective categories, and then also some smaller dots for um, singular uh, scenario data for IEA. So overall, um, the while by the total energy investments so far were dominated by fossil extraction shown on the left bottom side with very ambitious um, peak temperature scenarios these would need to decline and um, the models are actually quite uh, 
yeah, there's some divergence across model, let's put it this way, and I'll I have a dedicated slide on this to dive deeper into that. But very prominently, the, the main result to bring about this decarbonization of electricity is not very surprisingly to scale up um, electricity sector investments uh, considerably. Um, and the total, and, and lastly, on the bottom right, you see that also efficiency and investment into low carbon fuels increase um, uh, very clearly with um, uh, increasing uh, temperature ambition, but at a much lower level overall, because also um, some of these technologies are in, in yeah, lower levels of maturity so far. Um, now, looking in detail at what happens in terms of energy, uh, power sector investment. Um, so you see that also with the dashed lines um, in the background, the uh, most of the investments so far also went into transmission and distribution and storage as seen on the right hand side. And this is also expected to increase or is, would require to increase for ambitious um, peak temperature targets. But in terms of the generation side, there would really be a strong shift, whereas kind of so far it was really um, solar, wind, fossil and other low carbons generating roughly similar amounts of investments. They would increase a lot for solar and wind uh, roughly at the same scale as for the other low carbons, the hydro, nuclear and biomass combined. Whereas for fossil, all but one model see that there's clearly um, a strong decline, um, and it's basically just a bit of gas-fired uh, power generation in a few countries, and in some cases also combined with CCS that is compatible with low um, peak temperature targets. And on the other side, were the fossil uh, extraction investments um, that you saw, seen before on the left uh, top side now um, zoomed in a bit further, you again see that there's many models where actually this is only estimated by using the demand for um, these energy types um, multiplied with a constant elasticity. Whereas there's this one model in, in uh, um, pink, the witch model, where there is actually a more dynamic um, representation behind where you also see that there might be an over um, proportional decline investment because you see in the witch model on these three other panels, the decline in, in volumes of these uh, fuels is actually very similar. And there's a good reason for thinking that there might be this really strong uh, decline in investments because um, obviously there is a huge um, um, level of, of extraction installations in place, which also can, um, uh, with only limited investment in terms of uh, in operation and maintenance investments, can still um, produce um, lots of these fossil fuels. And then the latest, well, Energy Outlook of the IEA, they have estimated that um, there is this 130 uh, exajoules of oil production in 2030, um, indicated by that dotted line on the right uh, upper quadrant, that is possible to generate without any new investment into new fields, only requiring investment in, additional, uh, in, in um, existing fields. And I think this is a very strong message that these very low um, peak temperature target might um, require the demands that, that can be fulfilled with existing infrastructure from the oil sector. Um, and again, to put that into context, this is obviously uh, one of the results where the COVID um, implications would um, have a potentially a high impact, potentially furthering this result and bringing the overall um, front of this curve of primary energy demand further down. Um, yeah, and with that, I basically leave you the conclusions in written and basically, um, as I have uh, taken up some of my Q&A time already, directly go to Q&A and look forward to some questions. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks. We have a we have question. A... Sorry, I've got an echo. Um, Low contribution of energy and in intensity in the fuels to 2030. Uh, presumably, they contribute more in time um, for 2050. Is this related to inflexibility or inexistence of infrastructure for new fuels, biofuels, e-fuels, hydrogen, versus flexibility for power, installing more RES? Yeah, great question. Um, definitely, they, they, that's uh, the thing. They definitely contribute more um, uh, in later time steps, but the, the problem is really um, 
I mean, the, the, there's the, the infrastructure side. So you really, in some cases, require a dedicated infrastructure, which just really takes time. So there's planning times involved and so forth. But then on the other hand, it's also the maturity in terms of is it possible to uh, kind of finance projects with uh, yeah, more normal kind of financial products, or is it only super risky um, um, projects that kind of also require specific financing forms? Um, and, and this all, I guess, speaks for the fact that um, it's, it's really likely that the bulk of near-term investments needs to go into that low carbon power supply. That is not to say that these lower volumes of investments into these other technologies is not as important, right? I mean, this is very clear to communicate. It's not about saying, and um, this is the only thing that counts. And uh, you can be like for the world as a total to invest into renewables um, is um, it's enough. That's definitely not the message that we want to convey here. It's um, both things are important, but in terms of the volumes for the next 10 years, for different reasons, um, um, the low carbon supply and, and power dominate. Thanks. Um, let's move to our next presentation, um, Jay. And please continue to ask Christoph questions um, in the Q&A. Thanks very much. Sorry, Jay's going to be presenting on the Ambition Club, um, Article 6 um, Compacts Incentivize Enhanced Paris Ambition. All right. All right. And... Perfect. Okay. Great. So um, this is a, uh, a presentation. Uh, Shaw, you and I have been working on this, but we've been helped by many, many other people. Um, it's uh, a presentation about something which we call an ambition club, which is would be a compact that is uh, outside of uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, but would use Paris um, tools, including Article 6, uh, to enhance ambition. So uh, this is a talk in two parts. Uh, first, I want to talk about the motivation, uh, which is a quick review of last year's IAMC presentation on the potential that Article 6 creates for enhancing ambition without any increase in cost, um, and then uh, how an ambition club compact, uh, which is actually a ratchet mechanism, uh, how it might actually uh, deliver uh, on that potential. Uh, and so uh, let me begin by just reviewing the, uh, uh, the basics. Uh, as we all know, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, said uh, the long-term, uh, one of the long-term goals is to limit climate change to well below two degrees uh, and pursuing best efforts to uh, limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees. The principal instrument by which uh, that long-term goal is implemented is the nationally determined contribution in which each country uh, de uh, determines its contribution to that goal and the intent is that by each country uh, doing as much as it possibly can, uh, these goals can be achieved. The default assumption is that every country in the Paris uh, Agreement would uh, implement its NDC independently. Uh, but in uh, the Paris Agreement, there is Article 6, and it allows countries to work together to meet their NDC goals um, uh, with two provisos. Uh, one is uh, in getting together, you can't double count. And two, uh, that uh, it, when you get together, you can't reduce your nationally determined contributions. You can jointly implement them, but you can't reduce them. And so uh, much of the discussion that has gone on, uh, which has left Article 6 rules undefined, have been arguments about uh, double counting and reduced ambition. We're not gonna take those on here, uh, but rather uh, look forward to a time when uh, that we can actually utilize uh, the, this uh, um, article. So uh, last year, uh, this is an update from the presentation Shah and I gave uh, last year. Um, what we found was that if you took the NDCs uh, that uh, countries had uh, put forward uh, that in 2030, uh, the end of the first contribution period, uh, they, uh, that countries uh, would be uh, able to 
uh, save $300 billion per year in 2030 uh, if they implemented their NDCs jointly uh, as opposed to uh, implementing them independently. Um, and that if you reinvested those savings into enhanced ambition, uh, you would be able to increase ambition by approximately 9 billion tons of CO2 per year in the year 2030. And so what we showed was that NDCs uh, would uh, be able to reduce emissions relative to a, a reference scenario uh, to roughly stable uh, values uh, if implemented successfully, but that if uh, joint implementation efforts were undertaken uh, and you could reinvest the savings, uh, that you could get to the green line, uh, which was the enhanced uh, uh, ambition scenario. But, the, uh, but how do you get uh, from the potential uh, to the realization? And that's the motivation uh, that we take into trying to think about, are there ways that uh, you can get to that potential? Now, Article 6 is the mechanism by which you, you um, are able to uh, uh, obtain the savings. And so the question that we, we put to ourselves was, uh, well, could we use Article 6 uh, and add uh, uh, extra um, uh, terms and conditions uh, to enable the parties to actually uh, ratchet up into extracting the potential. And hence uh, the creation of this concept of an ambition club. So our concept of an ambition club is a group of countries that agree to work together to more efficiently reduce emissions and apply part of the gains from the collaboration toward increasing ambition. Uh, in this particular experiment, uh, we require that members increase their NDCs, ratchet up ambition, uh, by some fraction of their emissions trades. So for every ton of CO2 traded, a fraction of that ton of CO2 must be added to both the buyers and the sellers next period. And we use five-year increments for our periods. Next periods, nationally determined contribution. And of course, you cannot... Uh, reduce your level of commitment. So the Ambition Club is voluntary. It's not, it would not be part of, of uh, Article 6 rules, but would be a group of countries that uh, formed a compact uh, that said we uh, as countries agree to these terms and conditions. So this experiment occurs within a contribution period uh, because we were motivated by could it be used to extract the potential. Um, uh, of course, there, there, there's the potential for cheating, uh, and the penalty for cheating is that if a party fails to increase its ambition over its NDC as agreed, uh, they would not be allowed to trade in the next uh, period, the next five-year period. So uh, let's take a look at some of these uh, results. So we looked at four different ratchet mechanisms uh, that we applied, uh, and I want to uh, point out here that in these experiments, we're only going to look at the fossil fuel and industrial emissions, while in the work that I showed you earlier, we looked at both fossil fuel and industrial as well as land use change emissions. And so here, we're only going to look at fossil fuel and industrial emissions trades. Um, so looking at the, the, the trades in the figure to the left, you can see who the buyers and the sellers are. The sellers are countries like Africa, which are in the purple, uh, India, which is in, in the dark green, um, and uh, China, uh, which is in the gold. Uh, the U.S. and Europe are the principal uh, buyers in these uh, Article 6 transactions. Um, so uh, we looked at, at four different ratchet mechanisms uh, that uh, range from one, uh, numbered one to four, uh, as we move from one toward four, uh, the, uh, uh, the level uh, of, of commitment uh, to increase ambition uh, rises. Uh, it, and you'll notice uh, um, uh, immediately uh, that there's an asymmetry to the commitment increases. Um, 
and that uh, will become uh, apparent as, as, as we move for, forward why that why we looked at this asymmetry. But the basic notion is that sellers have more uh, potential for increasing ambition without increasing their cost than the buyers uh, do. Uh, so uh, let's take a look to see what the what the outcome of applying that ratchet mechanism would be. Uh, the green dot in the in, in the figure on the left uh, is the potential, the, the maximum potential we uh, observe uh, for uh, uh, the ability to increase ambition uh, under Article Six uh, without increasing costs. Uh, uh, compared with independent implementation of NDC. So that's where you extract the full potential within the period. Uh, the, uh, the, the NDCs themselves uh, are the orange line at the top. And so those two lines, uh, the dark green and the orange line at the top, uh, bracket the NDC contributions uh, and the potential to enhance ambition. And you can see as the ratchet mechanisms uh, ramp up from one to four, that increasing amounts of emissions mitigation are obtained uh, such that uh, by the time we get to ratchet mechanism four, uh, we find that you've gotten to the full amount of the in, uh, potential enhanced ambition. So that's the good news. Um, the, uh, uh, the bad news, I think, is that if we take a look at the distribution of costs that the mechanism, that the ratchet mechanism imposes, and compare it to the costs under the independent implementation of NDCs, that in 2025, everyone's better off, nobody's worse off. But by 2030, the buyers are all worse off than they would have been, regardless of whether we use ratchet mechanism two, three, or four. Um, even though the sellers are better off than they would have been had they implemented their NDCs independently. So uh, we take away from this that uh, yes, substantial potential exists to enhance ambition through cooperative implement implementation of NDCs without increasing costs beyond those that would be experienced under independent implementation. Most of the potential to increase ambition without increases in costs are in the seller regions. Uh, this leads to an asymmetry uh, in ambition ratchet coefficients, a potentially serious implementation problem. That is, it doesn't look fair uh, if you're a seller to have a higher level of ratchet. Um, and, uh, the, uh, but on the other hand, um, the, uh, the irony is that the sellers are all made better off under that ratchet mechanism uh, than uh, the buyers who are actually made uh, worse off. Uh, even though the ratchet mechanism uh, does increase ambition, uh, we do have the, these two uh, central problems of that uh, re remain within that kind of compact. So our future uh, work will be to explore inter-contribution period ratchets on, uh, rather than uh, within contribution period ratchet. And with that, uh, let me turn the floor back over uh, to the chair. Thanks, Jay. That was really interesting, um, especially the, the asymmetry and how that has different impacts on, you know, kind of an initially different uh, a counterintuitive initially uh, impacts on the buyers and sellers. Um, I had a couple of questions written down, but you ended up answering them <laughs> in all these slides. So I don't have any questions anymore. Um, so hopefully we get a couple from the audience. We do have time for one, I think. We've got one more minute. Um, and while people are typing questions in, um, I'll just note that since we started a few minutes late, I'm going to let this run five minutes into the poster session. So hopefully everybody can stick around. Um, and if uh, here we've got a question What is the reason for the benefits and costs for buyers and sellers? Um, the, the, the reason is just classic gains to trade. Uh, Article six allows countries to collaborate um, and by, uh, you, uh, by, by virtue of the fact that the marginal costs of meeting of NDC obligations uh, varies tremendously from country to country that if you are able to cooperate, the gains to trade uh, allow you to be 
uh, both parties to be better off and no one worse off, and therefore the costs are can be reduced uh, by the uh, high uh, marginal cost uh, uh, mitigators uh, doing uh, less and bribing the uh, low cost emissions mitigators to do more. Uh, and it's gains to trade 200 years uh, old uh, economics. Great, perfect timing. We do have some more questions in the um, in the Q&A that you can answer offline. And we can now move on to Shah, who our next two presentations are also about Article 6. And um, Shah is going to be presenting on the an intermodal comparison exercise looking at Article 6 that enhanced ambition. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, as Stephanie just mentioned that this is going to be closely linked to Jay's presentation, as well as Gunzi's presentation that's upcoming, uh, also looks at the value of Article 6. Yeah. There are two particular questions we're looking at in this work. Uh, the first one, if Article 6 were implemented perfectly, how much cost could be saved or reduced? And the second one, if all of this uh, cost savings were applied to enhanced ambition, how much more ambition might be there? So also worth noting that this is a multi-model uh, effort. Uh, the whole story starts from last year's IMC when we can all get together. So we've discussed the GCAM analysis in the last uh, IMC meeting and then had a group discussion with other teams. So then decided to do a joint study. So we have eight different models participating in this one, uh, AIM, EDF, CGE model, merge, message, GCAM, uh, image, remind, and which. So many of people on this panel, like Gamzi, uh, Christoph, Jay, are also part of the study. We are together looking at six different scenarios. Uh, the current policy reference, INDC, CNDC, ENDC, and also cost-effective 1.5 and 2 degree scenarios. I'm going to spend a little bit more time to explain uh, the core scenarios, INDC, CNDC, and ENDC. So in the INDC scenario, we basically assume that all the countries are going to uh, individually implement their NDC commitment. And here we use unconditional NDCs. In the CNDC scenario, which is our Article 6 case, basically all the countries are going to jointly implement their NDC and we're using a global carbon, uh, carbon carbon price instead of individual carbon price. For the ENDC scenario, we basically assume if we reinvest all the cost savings from, CN from Article 6, what additional ambition can be achieved uh, by, for each country. So basically in the ENDC scenario, every country have the same cost as their INDC implementation, but they will get additional mitigation. And before getting into the results, I do want to mention a range of issues that emerge from the uh, multi-model exercise or intermodal comparison. And this, these issues will have impact on the result. And first, like all the models define cost differently. Uh, some models use area under the marginal abatement curve. Um, other models use GDP loss, consumption loss. So they're all different metrics used to measure the uh, policy cost. And carbon price is the indicator that's used by all the models. So for a lot of comparison, you'll see in the later slides, we're comparing carbon price and to see how that differ across models. And second, the model uh, the models have different number of regions included, vary from 11 re regions to 32 regions. And we also observe that more regions normally imply for larger variability in uh, cost or carbon prices and also that, link, that leads to potentially higher savings. All the models also have different emission trajectories in the reference and NDC scenarios, and that will have impact on the results and cost savings potential. And land use things are also different, treated differently by different models. This will have implication on who are the buyers and who are the sellers, as well as potential of nature-based solutions uh, can be treated under the Article 6. And finally, all the models also uh, look at future project future differently or using different approaches to project future. Some models are optimization models and the others are dynamic recursive models. So although we focus on 2020 or sorry, 2020 to 2030 in this study, but pathways after 2030 also matter 
for the optimization models. So I think teams have to do some harmonization in that area as well. Yep. So let's look at what makes the savings possible. And because Jay just answered that question during the last Q&A session, that made my job much easier here. Yep. The, the, I think the key reason, as explained earlier, like is basically class against to trade that made all the saving possible. And to start, we just look at the common uh, metric car, uh, carbon price across models. And here it only shows the G can shadow price of carbon on the the red chart, you can see that uh, all different colored lines, there are the INDC carbon price. There is a large variability across regions in the INDC scenario in terms of their carbon price. Uh, so that makes the saving possible. And the red color line is basically a CNDC carbon price, which falls between the high and the low of the INDC carbon price. The, the price difference in INDC really leads to the savings potential. So now let's look at the results across the models. So basically each bar here represents the range uh, in carbon prices across models. And the black dots here is basically the CNDC carbon price. And you can see that for pretty much all the models, there's a large variability in carbon prices uh, in the INDC scenarios. Whereas in CNDC scenario, the carbon price across models range between like $10 per ton of CO2 to a little bit over $30 per ton of CO2. So for, for all the models, there are significant potential for savings. Now let's get back to our key question, uh, what how much cost could be reduced? So we do see uh, potential cost savings across all the models. However, the exact level of savings are different. And one thing I mentioned earlier that uh, we only we have different metrics used by different models to show the cost savings. So for the models use area under marginal abatement curve, uh, we see like between GCAM and image, they all see something around 300 to $400 billion per year of savings in 2030. And cost reduction in these two models are over uh, 75% when Article 6 is implemented. In terms of GDP loss, like reduction GDP loss for uh, wage and remind here are around probably around $100 billion per year. And we do have like other results from the other four models because Gamzi, I think, going to talk about message. So I'm not going to get into details on their results at this point. And the other question we're looking at is how large is the carbon market? So in terms of size of carbon market, we see variability across models. The top chart here shows the uh, physical market or physical trade volume. And we do see like the market ver size varies between like uh, 1.5 to 3 gigaton of CO2 per year in 2030 to something like 4 to 6 gigaton, gigaton of CO2 per year in 2030. So there are variability in uh, size of market. In terms of financial flows, I think there are also two kind of different categories, like the smaller size of the market is ranges between 15 to $35 billion per year in 2030, whereas uh, the larger markets implies for about 55 to $85 billion per year uh, market size in 2030. And so there's like, it's a fairly dynamic market. And the other question we're looking at is also, who are the potential seller sellers and who are the potential buyers? And again, just taking the GCAM as example here, anyone above the zero line are sellers. Uh, anyone below the zero lines are the, bu the buyers. And there are a lot of colors here, so I'm just going to walk through them briefly. So the top, like the purple colors, they're the Africa, African countries. Uh, the bright yellow is China. And the greenish colors are uh, India, South Asia, South Asia countries. And on the buyer side, the Red color is US, and then the, all the blue colors are uh, European regions. So let's expand a little bit on what all the model, all the other models say. So although the trade volume varies across models, but models show some similar set of sellers and buyers. Some common sellers across all the models are China, India, Russia, and some common buyers across all the models are. EU countries, US, Canada, uh, OECD, Asia, that's Japan and Korea, and also 
Australia and New Zealand. We do also see that there are some regions uh, show up as buyer in certain models and seller in the other models. That's mostly like African regions, the purple color, and they're sellers in say GCAM and message, but they are buyers in Remind. And we suspect it's mostly caused by the different land use structure of the models and also a range of other factors mentioned in the earlier slide. In terms of financial flows, as mentioned earlier, like we do see different size of financial market, like from the smaller ones, like 15 to 35 billion dollar per year to the larger ones, like 55 to 85 billion dollar per year. And on the upper side, I think we're close to the World Bank estimates, which is about roughly 100 billion dollar per year for carbon trading. Then the other major question we asked is, if we reinvest all the cost savings from implementing Article 6, how much additional mitigation can we get? And this basically shows emission trajectories across models in all the scenarios. So the shaded areas are the range uh, of emissions across all the models. So the uh, grayish color on the top is the reference scenario results. The pinkish or red pinkish color is INDC range. The yellow color or yeah, the yellow shaded areas or the ENDC basically are in enhanced ambition range. And then the blue and green are two green 1.5 degree range. And we do think one thing to note here is that models show a varying degree of enhanced ambition and some shows more, some shows less. But when the models showing significant savings are getting us closer to the two degree scenarios. And we do expect things may change a little bit as we continue to revise results and then harmonize uh, our reference and NDC assumptions across models. So just some high level takeaways from the uh, model into comparison. So all, although different models use different variables to re represent costs and extra savings across models, all models do show some potential savings by implementing Article 6. And the carbon price uh, range differ across models when Article 6 is in place from $9 to $32. We also see different sizes in, in terms of market. In terms of physical market, we do see like uh, smaller markets range between 1.5 to 3 gigaton of CO2 trade per year to the larger ones like ranging from 4 to 6 gigaton of CO2 trading per year. And similar observations uh, we saw in the financial market, there are different sizes of market. And finally, I think in the last slide, like all the models do show a uh, potential for enhanced ambition, which basically means like with the same cost as your INDC implementation cost, you will get additional ambition by using Article 6. So with that, I'd like to turn back to Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks, Sha. That was very interesting. Um, first question um, is, these are very interesting results in size of the carbon market differ strongly between different models. One question for clarification, are technology costs harmonized between the different models, at least to some extent? For instance, key technologies like PV and EVs. Yeah, that's a very good question. And the answer is no, we did not harmonize technology costs. And I suspect that's also contributing to the differences. Thank you. So I think, yeah, um, I have a question. I think you touched on this, but the, um, I, I can't remember the full if there was a full explanation. The um, number of regions in each scenario or in each model um, did that correlate with the gains from trade and ability yeah. to invest ambition? Right. I think that's also contributing to a different level of trading because uh, some models have more regions that also implies to a larger variability in carbon prices and to some extent can lead to larger cost savings, with, whereas models with less regions may have less variability and lead to smaller savings. Yeah. OK, great. Um, and we do have some more questions in the chat, um, but let, let's go ahead and go to our last presentation, which is Gamza, who will also be presenting on um, Article 6. Perfect. OK, uh, well, hello, everybody. So we have already listened two very interesting presentations about Article 6. And uh, I will be presenting a very similar type of work, assessment of the 
economic and environmental, environmental potential of Paris Agreement Article 6. Um, so message model of EASA was also one of the integrated assessment models that participated in the previously presented modeling into a comparison study and um, therefore a very, very similar scenario design and um, similar set of goals are also valid for this study. Um, so the first motivation was to contribute to the uh, modeling into a comparison study uh, led by colleagues from Pacific Northwest uh, National Laboratory and um, assess the economic and environmental potential of Article 6 uh, by using Message IX Globime integrated assessment model. And um, during this process, we had the chance to observe the behavior of our model uh, with emission trade scenarios and therefore um, determine if there are sections that might require improvement uh, or further investigation. Um, so, message X Globime with 11 regions and 10 years time steps uh, is used for this study. And as mentioned before, the scenarios follow um, very similar logic uh, with the previously presented modeling studies. Um, INDC scenario refers to the regional implementation of the unconditional NDCs, and CNDC refers to the cooperative implementation. Uh, of those targets. Um, so before going uh, into the economic indicators, uh, we can take a look at the financial size of the market. And we can see that from 5.7 uh, gigaton of mitigation in INDC scenario, um, 3 gigaton is redistributed in the market in 2030 uh, in cooperative scenario. And the trade flow also reveals the importer and exporter regions. And we can see that um, centrally planned Asia, CPA region, uh, is the major exporter, while North America uh, is the major importer with 55% share uh, among the importers in the year 2030. Um, so to have uh, more insights on the economic benefits globally, uh, there are two basic indicators that this study looks into. And the first one is the global weighted average carbon price, uh, which uses the emission mitigation rates. And we can see that the carbon price, which is in range of 50 to $65 per ton of CO2 in regional implementation, uh, decreases to a range of 9 to $15 in CNDC scenario. So this comparison basically uh, reveals the existing economic inefficiency due to regional implementation. And when we look at the global um, GDP loss difference between two scenarios, um, we see global GDP gains in the cooperative scenario uh, reaches actually up to 50% uh, in the year 2050. Um, so far, the basic uh, indicators show that there are significant global benefits. And then the next situation actually at the regional level. Um, so as a first step on the right hand, uh, on the left hand side, we use a rough indicator um, that aims to approximate the area under marginal cost curve uh, to see the regional benefits. And um, we can see that the gains are dominated by um, the regions that are heavily importing and for the other regions there seem to be benefits as well even though they are not as much as these three regions. And the um, surprising part was um, finding out that the regional GDPs uh, reveal a counterintuitive result. Um, so in cooperative scenario uh, the importer regions such as North America, Pacific Asia again have the major GDP benefits and some exporter regions, which you can see with the arrows, also experience um, positive GDP changes in some of the years. Um, however, mainly um, CPA region as a major exporter of the emission allowances uh, has a consistent negative GDP change uh, with a larger share over the years um, in the cooperative scenario. So this pattern led to um, an investigation of the GDP components and the macroeconomic model that we're using uh, more closely for the uh, exporter regions, especially for CPA region. 
And um, the first step was to observe what is actually going on with the components of GDP. Um, so here on the left side, um, there are two representative exporter regions. And I would like to mention a few insights um, regarding the GDP behavior, and these can be further uh, examined. So one observation is uh, over the years, we see that for the export to regions, um, change in field trade revenues also play an important role in the trade balance. Um, so basically import of um, certain fields increase, uh, mostly low carbon fields, and therefore, it seems like um, the profits of the certificate trade um, are cancelled out due to decreased uh, fuel trade revenues. So we can say uh, we observe a substitution uh, effect between these two different types of trades. And in case of CPA, uh, we see that methanol, ethanol and uh, LNG import costs are increasing. So this is a factor that um, reduces the positive gains from certificate trade. And uh, in another export region, FSU, um, we do not observe a persistent negative change in GDP. So there are also years with positive GDP change, which are underlined in red. And those years, um, certificate trade revenues are also supported by gains from fuel trade. So this um, substitution effect that we observe mostly happens in CPA region and also in some years in other exporter uh, regions as well. And um, another factor that is also in exploration phase is one of the behavioral parameters of, of macroeconomic model. So it is the elasticity of um, substitution between capital, labor and energy, uh, which measures the degree of reduction in economic output required to achieve the mitigation targets and the lower this value, the higher this economic loss will be. Um, so the usual assumptions um, that we have in message model categorizes CPA as a developing region with a 0.2 elasticity value. And um, considering this region is actually evolving towards being a developed economy, um, it is reasonable to make tests with higher elasticity values. And actually the initial results show that this might indeed be an area to explore um, since the increase of this elasticity triggers positive GDP change, at least in the near term for CPA. Um, so this is an initial insight that can actually be explored more systematically also for the other export regions as well. Um, and finally, one important aspect um, is the implementation challenges and the equity discussions between the regions. Uh, which I believe it's also relevant from the economic perspective. Um, so there is not much time to discuss those very detailed, but the models, of course, uh, provide optimal results with the economic efficiency as an objective. Um, however, the ideal picture of the trade market can raise some concerns, uh, as we see in this figure, which compares the domestic efforts versus um, traded quantities to reach the NDC targets. And uh, one of the most important of those concerns is that uh, avoiding carbon emissions becomes a luxury for some of the developed regions, um, such as North America, which turns out to be satisfying 80% um, of its targets by buying emission allowances. Um, so in the end, this mechanism should not be a way for any region to waive their responsibility, but instead transitioning to a low carbon economy should be a common practice for each and every region. Um, so economic implications under such concerns or any relevant uh, equity limitations uh, would also be interesting future work. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude by saying, um, so as a result of this study, we observe um, there are significant economic benefits globally and also benefits for regions at the marginal cost level, uh, but regional GDPs should be actually investigated more carefully, um, especially for export to regions, uh, since the field trade interactions and um, some modeling assumptions, such as those el elasticity factors, um, have influences on regional GDP changes. 
and a complete focus on minimum cost of abatement can uh, give rise to equity concerns, which can be an interesting uh, future work area. And also uh, the dynamics affecting the regional GDP behavior for the exporter regions um, can be further um, examined as well. Um, so that is all from my side and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very thank much. You. That was that was really interesting, especially the deeper dive into the mechanics of what's going on in specific model and message. Um, so we're like I said, we're going to go a few minutes longer just to allow time for Q and A since we had to start a little bit late. Um, and just a reminder that the Q and A will be open um, after even after we close the session. And while we wait for um, some questions to show up in the Q&A, if any of the presenters have questions for each other, now would be a great time to ask them, or perhaps they've been asked already in the in the, in the Q&A. Okay. Um, well, I do want to thank everybody for sticking around a little longer. We had seven excellent presentations and great audience participation, and actually really big audience turnout. So. I'm very glad to see all the interest in, in the work here. Um, and do check back if um, uh, your questions haven't been answered yet, um, or if you have more to ask, go ahead and, and our presenters will check back, I'm sure. So thank you very much and enjoy the poster session.